The other day, Brianna Wu tweeted out something that I think is undeniably true. She said, real talk, we'll never get progressive policies like universal health care if we don't nuke our growing extremism. No one is going to toss the government keys to a movement screaming globalize the intifada and pretending Houthis are oppressed and not terrorist fanatics. Most Americans are not terribly engaged in politics, and they tend to be put off by inflammatory rhetoric. So if the goal is to persuade normies, shouting globalize the intifada is probably ill-advised. This is something the ACAB and defund the police crowd learned the hard way. More on that later. By the way, don't take this for concern trolling. I don't want these people to succeed, so I'm perfectly fine with them keeping this up. I don't think she was referring specifically to terminally online people, but this undeniably applies to them. Then again, most terminally online people are in an echo chamber. So all their sloganeering is mostly just shouting into the void. That said, if it has any effect at all, it's almost certainly negative. The Amazing Atheist responded to Wu by tweeting, No one is going to toss the government keys to anyone, regardless of the supposed sanity of their rhetoric. If you want those keys, you're going to have to take them. And that means, if you're not willing to be an extremist, you might as well learn to love the whip. You fight the power, brother. TJ is engaging in another pastime of the terminally online. LARPing is a revolutionary. I have some bad news for people who engage in inflammatory rhetoric that alienates people. You need lots of people on your side to get done whatever it is you hope to accomplish. To say the online left doesn't have any real plan for taking power, much less enacting their agenda should they ever get power, is to say the least of it. But in one sense, they're hardly unique. Every president, and pretty much anyone who gets power to enact an agenda, eventually has to confront something that they almost always fail to appreciate beforehand, the practitioner's veto. The practitioner's veto was a concept I was aware of from my time working for large corporations. You'll probably recognize it too if you've had similar work history. But the name for it wasn't something I was aware of until I read the book Gradual, The Case for Incremental Change in a Radical Age, by Gary Berman and Aubrey Fox. The practitioner's veto is the idea that people making plans, whether they're corporate, political, or other leaders, have to get buy-in from the people on the ground who are implementing the policies. Failure to get the rank and file on board necessarily means that even the best laid plans will never become reality in practice. As Berman and Fox write, Scientist and philosopher Alfred Korzybski issued a famous dictum that is relevant here. The map is not the territory. Even the best, most detailed maps cannot accurately represent reality. The same is true for laws, rules, regulations, policy guidebooks, and other documents that seek to dictate the behavior of government officials on the ground. Policies that are crystal clear when they are written in legislative chambers or in downtown office headquarters often don't make sense out in the field, where government workers must handle individual cases, idiosyncratic clients, and unusual fact patterns. Between the lines, street-level bureaucrats inevitably wield enormous discretion, and they often use this discretion to resist or undermine diktats from above. The practitioner veto can take many different forms, leaks to the media, whistleblower complaints, lawsuits, and more. Often, the practitioner veto is invisible to the naked eye. Street-level bureaucrats know that if they can just drag their feet for long enough, a new set of political leaders will soon come into their agency with a new set of directives replacing the ones that they object to. Street-level bureaucrats resist direction for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes their motives are high-minded, as in the case of the federal officials who thought that Trump was violating the rule of law. And sometimes they are simply matters of personal preference, like a desire to move through their daily routine with a minimum of hassle or to ensure that they leave work promptly at 5 p.m. Again, I've seen this in my own working life. If management came up with a plan that wasn't workable, practical, or appealing, for whatever reason, the labor force would abandon it quickly. Disciplinary action did help enforce it, but that had its limits too. It's just too difficult to watch that many people at one time. And if it really was unworkable for some reason, management would usually abandon enforcement as well. A lot of people express frustration with politicians, particularly presidents, for not living up to their campaign promises. If they had only fought harder, they would have achieved the goal. If they had only listened to me, they would have gotten so much more done. They must never have really wanted it, or they must be corrupt, or something like that. I have no doubt that politicians do make empty promises, but the practitioner's veto is a constant obstacle every president has to deal with. President Trump ran on some lofty goals. He was going to build the wall, he was going to drain the swamp, he was going to eliminate the national debt through economic growth, etc. I'm sure you all remember. 
Trump also had a serious problem with his subordinates not carrying out his orders. According to The Week, Trump's first Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, rebuffed direct orders from Trump on a regular basis. Tillerson suggested that during his tenure, he was often stepping in to tell Trump that the things he was trying to do were illegal. I'd have to say to him, Mr. President, I understand what you want to do, but you can't do it that way. It violates the law. It violates treaty. This made Trump really frustrated, he said. It wasn't just Trump's inner circle, though. Regular government employees refused the president at multiple points, including on his biggest issue, immigration. Multiple times during his presidency, Trump threatened to bus migrants into sanctuary cities. Trump faced resistance from, among others, the people within Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, and the Department of Homeland Security, claiming that they lacked the resources and legal authority to follow through. As the Washington Post reports, if we would have done that, we would have had to expend transportation resources and make a decision that we're going to use buses, planes, etc. to send these aliens to a place for whatever reason, a senior DHS official said. We had to come up with a reason, and we did not have one. The sanctuary city proposal ran contrary to ICE policy guidelines, as well as legal counsel. ICE officials balked at the notion of moving migrants to detention facilities in different areas, insisting that Congress only authorizes the agency to deport immigrants, not relocate them internally, according to DHS officials. Trump is hardly unique in this way. President Biden is currently experiencing his own internal revolt thanks to his administration's refusal to call for a ceasefire in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As of the writing of this video, Biden has lost his Secretary of Education, officials in the State Department, and was called out by 17 anonymous re-election campaign staffers in a post on the website Medium for failing to call for a ceasefire. This is nothing new. Pretty much every president has encountered this in some form. As David Rohde writes in In Deep, The FBI, The CIA, and The Truth About America's Deep State, every modern American president has expressed distrust of career government officials in Washington. They view themselves, correctly, as carrying a democratic mandate from voters to implement the policy platform that they promised voters. Jimmy Carter feared that members of the CIA would refuse to implement reforms designed to end decades of agency abuses. Ronald Reagan thought liberals in the State Department opposed his effort to confront communism. George H.W. Bush distrusted independent councils. Bill Clinton believed the FBI had gone rogue. George W. Bush's administration searched intensively for the intelligence officials who they thought leaked the existence of his post-9-11 warrantless eavesdropping program. Barack Obama feared that Pentagon officials had tried to box him in into deploying large numbers of troops in Afghanistan. Leftist causes at a more local level have dealt with this as well. Following the start of the Black Lives Matter movement, a number of progressive district attorneys running on progressive reforms to the criminal justice system were elected in large cities across the United States. These DAs proposed such things as ending cash bail, preventing juveniles from being tried as adults, and rolling back sentencing enhancements by judges. Almost all of them have encountered internal revolts, perhaps most notably George Gascon in Los Angeles. As Berman and Fox write, Almost immediately, many of the prosecutors in Los Angeles revolted. The Association of Deputy District Attorneys, the union that represents Gascon's prosecutors, sued, arguing that Gascon had violated state law. As with the Trump resistors, Gascon's adversaries portrayed themselves as defending the rule of law. You can't just use the law to implement your personal worldview of what society should look like, Deputy District Attorney Eric Siddall said. The idea of one man coming in and saying, you are all wrong and this is what the law should be, is kind of counter to what our entire American system of justice is all about. It's the antithesis of the rule of law. Remarkably, the California District Attorneys Association, the group that represents California's 58 elected district attorneys, publicly backed the challenge to Gascon. Some opponents even attempted to launch a recall campaign to oust Gascon. Though this effort ultimately failed, the Battle of Los Angeles is still raging as we write this, thanks in no small part to significant increases in violent crime, which have only helped to fuel the anger of Gascon's opponents. A similar phenomenon is also taking place in San Francisco and several other cities that have elected progressive prosecutors seeking controversial changes in their local justice systems. Online activists love to complain about do-nothing politicians sitting on their hands rather than fixing problems. It really does matter. I mean, listen, guys, uh, we could actually fight for this right now, you know, kind of like how we did for raising the debt ceiling back in 2021. But we could use this tragedy for our own fundraising and campaigning purposes. So I'm going to campaign right now. Please elect more of us, even though we've completely dropped the ball 
and haven't delivered what we said we would deliver as we were campaigning. When those runoff senatorial elections were taking place in Georgia, and we were telling the American people how important it was to ensure that those two Democratic candidates won the Senate seats, because that would mean we'd have the majority and we could actually get our agenda done. We were lying actually about that, we were just lying. And it's not like this is entirely unwarranted, except all people in power face constraints that activists don't appreciate, the practitioner's veto being just one of them. Now, it's worth noting that this is a value neutral thing. Were bureaucrats right to resist these orders? Would we have gotten better results had they implemented the plans as they were written? That depends on the issue and who you ask. I'm not here to adjudicate any given matter. That's just not the point of this video. I'm merely pointing out that the practitioner's veto is a conservative force in the most literal sense of the word conservative. It prevents drastic change from happening quickly, and it's a force that anyone in power has to contend with. Perhaps if the left took power, they would find a way around it. I'd love to know how, though. Presumably, they'd attempt to bring the bureaucracy to heel through disciplinary action. But that relies on its own set of policies, which would inevitably be enforced by people as well. They'd have to get buy-in from a different rank and file to make that happen. Any agenda someone seeks to implement necessarily relies on people to enact it. And if you don't have buy-in from those people, your agenda is going nowhere. Failure to do so means your plan won't work in practice. And any plan that doesn't work in practice is a bad plan in principle. Mm.